Mr. Richard Warnicki. Did I say it right? Yeah, that's close enough. Yeah, Warnicki. So. Can we call you Warnie? You can if you want. <laughs> Warnicki. Warnicki, yeah. yeah. Right. So, mate, I, we, we should tell the, the, the people watching how we met. So we met at a car wash. Yeah, that's right. So I was right. getting my car wash. You were getting yours. We started talking. Uh, what do you do, mate? And, and you're going to elaborate on it, but, you know, you said you did marketing for the food industry. And, of course, when I hear food, I'm like, what? You know, like you're like a rock star to me, you know, like, you know, if you said that you're a rock star, I would be like, yeah, okay, that's all right, you know. But food? No, I've got to know about it. So then we started chatting and I just became fascinated with what you do because, you know, you've got insights into the food world, which, you know, <laughs> I just love to plug in and, and to learn. So before we get into the discussion of, you know, of, of, of everything food for all our foodie uh, uh, listeners. Tell us what exactly you do. I mean, you, you own you know, RW Marketing. So tell us, tell us exactly what it is that you do. Sure. So for the last 14 years, yeah. we've been a part of the food industry, working with producers, yeah. manufacturers, restaurateurs, pretty much the whole supply chain that goes in and out of this industry. So it's been really cool. Got yeah. to meet some amazing people, hear a lot of awesome stories and I guess learn a lot about food and how it works and we do this through sharing stories to help businesses succeed and grow. So you're sharing their stories. So you're, I mean, you get, you're jumping in there, you're doing the marketing for them. You record, I mean, you even, you, you've got your own studio, right? Yeah, that's right. So part of what we do is to actually understand what products they have, what yep. makes them different yep. and how we can actually market it. So yes, we do have a full studio, we even got a full commercial kitchen as well where we do cook-ups and I think you missed the last one because you were overseas yeah, travelling on yeah, the tour. Yeah, I was, mate, so. you always invite me and I'm, there's always some reason why I couldn't make it, you know, for some reason or another. Um, but we will get there, we, we, we definitely will. Mate, um, yeah, it's interesting. What what I find in one of the, one of the things that fascinates me about some of the ingredients that are out there is why are we why are we still paying a fortune for oysters when I mean I know back in the day oysters were what what seemed to be like and you know a, a rare commodity right well they're not are they really that rare now that we should still be paying that kind of money for them caviar there's another thing abalone explain to us why are these products you know lobster aren't these being farmed. Isn't there abundance of them? Why are we paying astronomical money for them? That's a great question. I guess over time, just like anything, people start to discover new products. They wonder, can I eat this? Should I eat this? Yeah. I really admire vegetarians because there were a lot of people that, should I eat this? Should I not? Mm. Not everything's edible, as you discover. Yeah. With a lot of products that we're talking about here, they are wild caught. And a lot of people think a lot of these products are farmed. Yes, there is a lot that is farmed, but then there's also a lot which grows naturally. So, for example, with Southern Rock Lobsters, those there are not farmed. Mm. Those are wild caught. So seasonality affects it. It's not like strawberries where you can grow them in greenhouses all year round or um, inside. So when it comes to abalone as well or mm. oysters, you've got spawning seasons. You've got different times of the year where they're more delicious than others. Mm. And yes, it is supply and demand too. So as the demand has gone up, the supply has not gone up at the same rate. So with restaurants taking a lot of stock, it's meant that the price has also gone up too. Mm. Um, so, so in your business, I mean, okay, obviously you're working with a lot of restaurants and doing promotions for restaurants and some of their key sort of meals that they have. But what about with the... With the ingredient side of thing, I want to I want to focus on that a little bit further before we get onto the restaurant side of it. Um, where where would you suggest you know people have you know getting the best oysters in Australia, you know um, the best sort of seafood, the best product, you know talk talk to us about that a little bit because it is like you said seasonality, you know, and a lot of people what you said before about uh, when they're spawning, I mean a lot of people have no idea that that's not the best time to eat. Mm. Is it oysters? That's great. Talk, talk to us about that. So Australia is full of abundance produce. Yeah. We've got some of the best produce in the world, whether it be our meat, our livestock, vegetables, um, right through to seafood, herbs. We're very privileged here as a country. We can even grow tr and farm truffles here, which yeah. 
depending where they're from, are comparable to the ones from Italy as well. So, so speaking about truffles, because I, I had a, um, uh, I was going to get some truffles for for Christmas, and we didn't end up getting them because the the ones that I wanted or the, how much I needed for the meal that we had was just too much. So, and they didn't have the supply of them. So, are the truffles that we buy in Australia, um, they're expensive. Is it because there's not many of them? Or, or is it just because truffles have that 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 expensive vibe like caviar? Why is it? And, and same with caviar. Mm. Tell us about that. So caviar and truffles, both beautiful things. You mm. either love them or you hate yep. them. Most people will pick one of them. And I guess if you're a truffle person or a caviar person, mm. it they are expensive premium products. Yes, there is prestige to them now. Mm. But back many years ago... Caviar was bar food. It was a cheap snack that they'd give people to have while they were consuming a drink. So, so why is it so expensive now? Because it's become marketed. It's become something people right. desire. So through successful marketing, mm-hmm. it's not just through that, but mm-hmm. there's different types of apples, mangoes, uh, kiwi fruit. Our yeah. kiwi fruits are well sought after around the world. Yeah, um, It's not just caviar, but... As soon as you start to market it, you then perfect the product as well. You start to streamline the process. You get consistent supply to an extent, but there's just not enough to go around, especially when we look to open up to export as well. The export consumption is massive. If you look at how many people are in this world, there's not enough food to go around for everyone. Mm. Is there, is there products that we um, – that, that – are produced here in Australia that we just don't consume a lot of that's consumed more elsewhere than in Australia? Maybe like for goat. Like I love goat, but I think we export more goat than we actually consume. There's so many products here that we do produce a lot of that yeah. does go overseas. So, yeah. for example, before COVID, yeah. a lot of our Southern Rock lobsters were going there. Yeah. Our wild caught abalone was mm-hmm. going there. However, as soon as COVID hit, those sanctions came in. It stopped. So there was no domestic market for those products. A lot of our meat and livestock, so that's goat, it's beef, it all goes overseas for export. Mm. Um, So a lot goes to China, through the UAE, Mm. right through Asia as well, Korea, Japan. So we're exporting phenomenal amounts of produce. Yeah, and um, I don't know if anyone listening or watching is going to have the same thought as I have. I've tried abalone in three different restaurants. I don't get it. I, I just am I missing? What am I missing? Am I am I having it the wrong way? I, I don't know. I just I've tried it three times, and all three times I went. I don't know. It's you know I just didn't get what you know. Sometimes you have something and okay, it's not. I don't like it, but maybe I can understand what other people like. I just couldn't understand. I don't like. It. I couldn't understand why anyone else would either. It just seemed bland to me. Am I am I am I missing something here? Abalone is actually one of the most challenging products to prepare right. and to cook. There are different types of it. Mm. So you've got black and green lip and it can be wild caught mm-hmm. or it can be farmed. Right. So traditionally, if we go back, here's a yeah. little history for you. Yeah. The Chinese, I guess, utilised it as a sign of wealth and abundance right. because a lot of China is inland. Yeah. So to get abalone was a luxury. So they would cook it slowly, render it down, break it down. Yeah over many hours and then heavily sauce it. Mm-hmm. And if you look at a lot of other styles of cooking, French cooking, yep. Italian cooking, yep. it's all about the sauces because we've never, back in those days, the produce quality was not as good as it is now. Mm. So you're trying to make sauces to cover this bland product. And sometimes when you've got a bland product and you're trying to modernise it and experiment with it to make it a new product on the menu... It is a bit of trial and error because it's a new taste. It's a new texture that you may not have had. Mm. And different restaurants have different concepts. There is a lot of education going on at the moment with abalone, caviar, truffles. Because these products here, it's something that on the menu five years ago, they weren't there. Mm. But now they are. So, look, maybe I'll ask you off air then. You know, maybe you can tell me and, you know, where. Okay, no, maybe I'll ask you now. Where, you you know. Okay, I'll give it another go. Where should I go and who's doing abalone really well that I 
that if I have it there, then I'll I'll understand. You know, then I'll go, wow, okay, right, I get it now. Because I should say, I should just backtrack here for a second. See, my mother-in-law doesn't like truffle, right? I love truffle. So I've got truffle salts, truffle oils, you know, whatever truffle honey, I, you know, I love it. But um, – and I said this to, to a friend of mine who's a truffle farmer out near Goulburn in, in rural New South Wales. And New South Wales, for our overseas listeners, is, is, the, is the state where Sydney is. Um, and it's about an hour and an hour and a half out of Sydney. And I said to him, I said, my mother-in-law hates truffle. She goes, you know, a lot of the people that don't like truffle are having it in truffle oils and it's, it's synthetic. Mm. And you'll find that if you actually have it where you shave it over the pasta or you know, whatever it is that you're having, you you might enjoy it a lot more, you know. So where would we get a good abalone in Australia? Who's doing it well? So to me, good abalone, it should be fresh, it should be wild caught. Mm. The good thing about fresh is you've got different characteristics just like oysters. Mm. So Scott Pickett's doing some great stuff with it. Yep. Uh, it was at the Australian Open this year as well mm-hmm. at some of the booths as well there. Yep. So a lot of restaurants are really starting to push it as mm-hmm. well. Uh, society in the city yeah yep. it, it's not just high-end venues that are looking to do it yep. it's also going into a lot of pubs and clubs now as right. well so it's starting to appear on pub menus mm-hmm. so they're starting to crumb it and deep fry it as well yeah, right. so, um, doing it on a mango salad mm-hmm. so again it's not just about it being a premium product in a fancy restaurant it's also very accessible now because mm. We do have a surplus of it here. Yeah. And what don't we have a surplus of in Australia? What do we? What kind of really ingredients that we use a lot of that we just have to import? Over the last few years, mm. we've definitely been very lucky yeah. with what we've had yeah. previously. Yeah. However, now we're starting to see shortages of livestock. So mm-hmm. that's beef. Yeah. Main reason behind that is bushfires started mm-hmm. at all, mm. droughts, mm. Uh, COVID. They stopped breeding as many because the demand dropped as well because Australians don't eat as much beef as we may think we do. More of our beef actually goes to export than domestically. Mm. And as a result of that with COVID, a lot of that market shifted and it left a lot of stock here which has now moved on. Yep. And it's just going to take a few years before that recovers. Yeah. And what about things like – spices and, and that kind of thing. I mean, I love using different spices. I, you know, that's sometimes what I like to call just just riffing. You know, I love cooking mm-hmm. um, and I just love riffing it. So I'll just have a look. Yeah, let me put a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I uh, kind of roughly know what will work together. But my mother-in-law cooks very, you know, simply. She, You know, she she won't use an abundance of spices. She used the staple ones that, you know, she's been taught, you know, with the, the Italian mum and grandmother. But I love using Arabic spices and, you know, Indian spices and stuff like that. Uh, how is that developing in Australia? It sounds, this sounds like an infomercial, doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds like we should yeah, be we've on got the, a pack of 10 on, spices. <laughs> it sounds like we should be we're on, doing like, a giveaway at the on, end on that morning breakfast show, you know. So tell us, Richard, um, how does, you know, yeah. but no, in seriousness, seriousness, you know, like all seriousness. Uh, we live in such a melting pot here of culture in Australia. It's good, isn't it? We're full of migrants. You yeah, know? I'm yeah. from Korea originally. Yeah. You're yeah. Italian yeah. by heritage. So you've got so many different cuisines yeah. here. So, of course, every culture mm. has its own cooking, its mm. own ingredients. Mm. So here we're blessed. You know, you've got places like Oasis Bakery that mm. have so many spices there. Mm. They're all freshly. Where's Oasis Bakery based? So they've got a few sites around. There's yep. one in Fairfield. Yep. There's one in Mornington and one yep. in Murrumbina as well. Right. in All in Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there you get really good spices. There's mm-hmm. Gert House as well. Mm-hmm. So oh, that's one of my. That's got to be one of my favourite spice shops anywhere in the world. You mm-hmm. know, and I've, and I've been to the Spice Bazaar in Turkey. Um, you know, it's obviously a lot more sort of crude. You know, mm-hmm. the kind of the spices are just placed out, but they do it so well, don't they? And we're so privileged here to have access to this. Yeah, you travel around the world, mm-hmm. you'll normally only find what's local there. Yep. You don't find a lot of imported products. Yeah let alone imported products that are made locally or produced yeah. locally. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of imported products then, you know, and because I'm Italian, <laughs> <let's>, <laughs> you know, Italian background, I should say, um, what's what's trending with Italy in, at the moment here? Because there, there's – and, and this is what's interesting. I, I was speaking to someone in, in Italy 
about a product that comes from the south, from a place in Calabria called Spillinger, called Enduja. N D U J A. You people start to seeing they're starting to see it now on menus, on pizzas and pastas and all that kind of stuff. But people in Italy themselves don't know what Enduja is. So if you go to the north and you, and you mention Enduja, some people over there don't even know what it is. But it's becoming more popular now here, and also you're spending a lot of time in North America. I'm starting to see it appearing on the menus over there. So what kind of stuff like that is is coming out of Italy? So I guess Italy's been a melting pot for food, flavour. Yeah. Everyone loves good Italian food, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, in regards to that, the good thing about Italian food is it's so versatile. You don't need to be of a certain nationality or have a certain profile. It's just a universal food that everyone seems to relate to. Yeah. And <clears throat> with that versatility comes the ability for other cultures to do things. So, for example... Did you know that there's now a Prosecco salami that comes out? No, I didn't know that. So, you know Prosecco? Yeah, of course, yeah. And yeah. there's salami. So you how do I say it, Richard? you got to say it. Prosecco. Prosecco. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 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 They've come together yeah. and James Mele from the meat room in Kilmore yeah. has produced this salami. Right. It took out gold prize last year mm-hmm. at the Salami Awards mm-hmm. and it got a perfect score, mm. which is unheard of. Yeah. That there is phenomenal. So you're starting to see different innovation and modern takes Mm -hmm. on traditional products. So, for example, salami to me was always fennel. It was always those more herbal flavours. Whereas now you're starting to see a lot more of a modern approach. Mm. You've then got burrata. Yeah. Burrata is a cheese that five years ago not many people knew about. Mm. If you weren't Italian. If you weren't Italian, yeah, of course, yeah. But now it seems to be sneaking its way onto menus everywhere, mm. whether it be pizzas, mm-hmm. pastas, yeah. bruschettas. Yeah. Uh, they're putting XO sauce on it in Chinese restaurants. Really? Yes. So well, Here in Australia? Correct. So yeah, Lucy right. Liu at the moment is working yeah. with that Samore cheese. Yeah. They've got a beautiful XO sauce that goes on top of it. Yeah. So again, it's that wow. mix of yeah. unami flavours. Yeah. Tonka's got a coriander paste that's going on it as well. Right. So I'm not sure how traditional that is for you. Look, no, no, look, some, you know, like, okay, so uh, we do this skit um, uh, online where we talk about, so we take, kind of take the piss out of the Italian way of life, the Australian way of life, Italian and, and English waiters and, and all this sort of stuff. And and the, um, now we did this one skit where I was in Italy, supposedly mm-hmm. in Italy, it was recorded in Sydney, and I was supposedly in a pizza restaurant and the waitress comes over and says, you know, um, uh, you know, she. I order um, seafood pasta. She puts it down. I said, "Excuse me, can I have some chili oil?" She rolls her eyes. Uh, okay, I'll go and get it for you. And, and can I have some cheese? And when I asked her for cheese, she loses it because in Italy you don't put pa- you don't put cheese on past on on seafood pasta. It's a it's a, a sacrilege. It's, it's a sin. You don't do it, and they lose it. Right. And it's the same with they don't like ham and pineapple pizza. You can't ask for ham and pineapple in Italy because people lose it. Do so, you like so ham and pineapple? I love ham and pineapple pizza. See, I'm, you know how much abuse I'm going to get? A co- <laughs> you know how much abuse I'm, I'm going to get? Just to, I might have to edit that bit out, <laughs> Richard. Um, so, so in Italy they're very traditional and they won't have certain things. I will experiment. So exo sauce on burrata, sure, why not? Mm. I love exo sauce. I love burrata. Let's, let's see what it's like together. I think that's going to develop, yeah? Correct. And this is where we've, at the moment, Mm. rising food costs, scarcity in food. Yeah. There's innovation that's happening by restaurateurs. Mm -hmm. They're finding new ways to excite the diners. Yeah. Because there's no point cooking something at a restaurant that you can make at home. Yeah, sure. Convenience is one thing. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, people are curious. They're looking to find new products. Yeah. And working with seasonal products, Mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot more innovation now than yep. over the last few years yep. because products are scarce. Some of the products that used to be a staple on many menus yep. are now quite expensive. Mm. Well, look, we're going to chat about um, restaurants and the differences and what people are doing in restaurants a little bit later. But you mentioned people cooking at home. Now, you don't just um, deal with ingredients and, and restaurants and food, but you also deal with equipment, mm. right? And I notice there's a growing trend of people cooking at home, charcoaling at home, you know, cooking 
with heat at home. Tell us a little bit more about where that's going and how that's progressed in the last few years here in Australia. So traditional smoking yep. on the barbecue or mm -hmm. in a smoker has been one of the things that kicked this off. Yeah. And where, where did that where where do you think that, that that started though? Is it been something that we've seen online that we thought or or is it, was there a show was a was there something that that spawned that sort of a craze? It's just about being able to push the barriers, do things differently. Yep. To be able to do a brisket yep. in 8 hours. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's got time after work to sure. do that. Right. Whereas now, I guess we're starting to see cooking over fire. Mm -hmm. So we've gone back to our roots. Mm -hmm. Cooking over fire, you get beautiful charcoal. Mm -hmm. So at home now, a lot of people are cooking over fire. They're mm -hmm. doing beautiful things mm -hmm. on maybe a hibachi grill. Mm -hmm. Things like MasterChef definitely put it on yep. um, the map. Mm -hmm. Restaurants, you get the amazing flavours yep. out of the commercial versions such yep. as the Jospers yep. where they seem to be the heart and soul of the kitchen now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've eaten at Fire Door, mm -hmm. which is great. But if there's anyone listening who lives in, in Brisbane or gets a chance to go to Brisbane, do you know the restaurant I'm about to say in Brisbane? Which one? Agnes. Agnes. Unbelievable. It, you know, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be able to travel and to eat at different places. And I was doing a show there last year and someone said, you must go to Agnes. And I'll tell you what, I, I haven't stopped thinking about it ever since I left the doors. Everything is smoked, including the the dessert. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really, it, it, you know, and I've eaten in a lot of different places around the world. I've never had those kind of flavours before in Australia. In fact, I can't remember really having like a whole menu of of where everything was smoked and it just gave you not only that smoke flavour but obviously combining with the flavour the, of, of the ingredients that you're smoking. Mm. And it was just fantastic. So it's really, really come up, hasn't it? Do you think COVID – well, I don't, probably, I don't I say it, I don't think – it probably has had an effect because people were at home – Mm. They had all that time. They were stuck at home. All of a sudden they're cooking and they're baking and they're, and all that kind of stuff. I just noticed a lot more people, I see it online too, just rubs, putting rubs into mm. food and stuff like that. You You've know? got a lot more time to be creative. So yeah. before COVID, everyone was in a rush. It's, mm -hmm. We need to do things quick. So a lot of people would buy pre-made sauces, yep. pre-made herbs mm -hmm. or pre-mixed herbs. Yep. But now people have realised this is fun. Mm. Let's get that creativity back. And yeah. I've seen it as an art. Yeah. What other equipment has, has <coughs> started to emerge at home? I mean, there's pizza ovens people use, you know. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. they're not uh, They're not just using them for, for pizza. They're using them to, to cook all sorts of things. Correct. Right? So I've recently become a, one of those people as well <laughs> yeah. with a pizza right. oven at home. So. Yeah. Do you do a lot of cooking? Or, or do you kind of say, oh, you know, this is my, this is what I do for a living. I don't want to know about it when I get home. Look, I enjoy cooking. I think it's a nice way to unwind. Am yeah. I a good cook? No, but I enjoy what I do. You know, for me, it's about simplicity. It's about bringing the best out of what you've got to work with. Hope you're enjoying the podcast. We'll be right back straight after this ad break. Hi, this is Joe Avati, and I am very proud to say that I am now one of the brand ambassadors for Elite Supplements. One of the supplements I take every day is Resveratrol, an anti-aging supplement. You know how they say that one glass a day of wine is good for you? It's because it's got resveratrol in it. But do you know how much wine you actually have to drink to get any benefit of it? 11 liters. Now, it doesn't take Einstein to figure out that if you're drinking 11 liters of wine a day, you ain't gonna be around long enough to see any benefit. So make sure you get your supplements from Elite Supplements. Resveratrol worked for me. Look how young I look. <laughs> and I'm 73. Hi everyone, I'd like to thank one of the sponsors of the podcast, St. Romeo, who provide great skincare products for men. I'm going to show you some of the products. St. Romeo Facial Cleanser, Rock and Roll Face Scrub. And if you had a rock and roll lifestyle, you're going to need a face scrub. This is their deep cleansing charcoal bar. How putting charcoal on your face cleans it, I have no idea, but it works. This is one of my favorites, the cucumber eye gel. <laughs> Must be for vegans. And they've got heaps of stuff for your hair too. Shampoos, styling creams, and um, stronghold for your hair. <laughs> Obviously, 
I don't need any of these. I'd like to thank St. Romeo for being one of the sponsors for the Joe Vardy podcast. Okay, so you're in touch with a lot of places where we can go, where the consumer can go to get really good produce when they're cooking. You'd rattle off a few of your favourite places that, you know, because you, you specialise mainly in Melbourne and Sydney, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, what what, what are some of your favourite places to go? Bakeries, delis, cheesemongers, fishmongers. Tell, tell us. Yeah, so look, I guess, um, as I said earlier, we've got so much great produce here. Yeah. But so many people just don't know where to go for it. Yeah. They'll go to Coles, they'll go to Woolworths. Mm -hmm. And it is what it is there. Yeah, right. You know, but there's great places out there. A lot of the independent supermarkets are doing yep. some great stuff. So mm -hmm. the IGAs, yep. yeah, Harris Farms as well up yeah, in Sydney. Sydney yep. um, you've got Isle of Capri, which has opened up there as well. Where's in, that? That's up in Brisbane. So, oh, right, okay. So yep. again... Oh, in, on, on the Isle of Capri? Yeah, correct. On oh, the oh, actual right. Isle of... Sorry, Gold Coast. On yeah. the Gold Coast, yeah. yeah right. so I used to live on the Isle of Capri when I was a kid. So in there, there's oh, a no, whole yeah. new concept there yep. where refillable milk, you've got beautiful produce, but... Even around the corner, you know, there's a new place that's just opening up this weekend called Umituchi. So Where? In? Ballwood. Oh, right. Okay. So it's opening up just um, locally and there you'll be able to find some really good quality steaks. We've got really good uh, caviar there as well. So they've gone all out, even specialised pork as well. Right. And, and so, so is it, is it, it provides everything or just... Specialising in just specialising in a lot of the good stuff. Yeah. Um, for seafood, you've got places like Gem Pier at the yeah. South Melbourne Market yeah. or Williamstown. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. What about Victor Churchill's? What a great place that oh. is, isn't it? How like, can you? It's unbelievable what they've got going yeah. on there. I think that the when they first opened in Sydney in Wallara, I think they were the they were the gourmet traveller rated them as one of the top ten food experiences to have. In Australia, and for those of you who are not familiar with them, look them up, Victor Churchill's. Um, it's uh, you can eat off the floor, sort of thing. It's a, it's a butch, and there's he's got they got they got this great sort of a window, and you see the butchers behind there with the butcher's block cutting up the meat, all dressed up, and it's just got. I mean, you know, you can get three, four hundred dollar a kilo steaks in there. Mm. Um, and I, I sat in the one in Melbourne recently. And because uh, I knew we were going to cook, be cooking some steak for, for uh, around Christmas time, and I, you know, and I said, "What? What's the? You know, give me a couple of tips on how to how to cook a good steak." And 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 she said to me, "The first thing is buy a good bit of meat. Mm. You know, you start off with shit meat. Well, you know, you're behind the eight ball already. Get a good quality piece of meat and put that on the barbie, and then start from there. You know. Agreed. So, um, yeah, where are some of your other? Uh, places that you like to source some food. Like I love going. I love going to all the markets, especially here in oh. in Melbourne. Like Paran markets for the for the for the mushrooms. Oh, you can't go past there. Yeah. Can you? Look, I think the markets are great. You know, yeah. you've got places like Emerald Hill Deli, yeah. Georgie's Harvest, the Polish Deli as well. Right. Those are at South Melbourne yep, Market. South Melbourne, yeah. Um, Gem Pier. Always. And then at Paran Market, you've got places like Gary's Quality Meats. Yeah. Where you just get great steaks and, again, mm. that very similar calibre to what you were saying about to Churchill. Yeah. And to Churchill you can even get a meal there, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. The one in Sydney I don't think you can eat, but the one in um, in, uh, in in Melbourne you can. Um, now, let's get to talking about restaurants mm. because you do a lot of work with restaurants. So in a kind of way, you, you know, you, you get to see what some of the top restaurants are doing before anyone else does. Because you're doing the marketing, and you do the marketing for quite a few of the top places. You know, I know every time I need to go somewhere to eat. I mean, not that you can necessarily get me in there, but I'm always, I'm always asking you, where do you suggest? Where you know, where where do you think I should be going to eat? You know, and every place that you've sort of steered me to has been, you know, fantastic. Um, so before we talk about some of your favourite places, there's there's a lot involved in a restaurant, and, and the restaurant business is changing. You know, tell us about some of the things, you know, and, and, and how how the the restaurant world is changing and what restaurant tours are doing to keep people in, capturing the market, how are they using um, uh, imagery, uh, how are they using social media, all that kind of stuff. 
restaurants these days are in an interesting place. It's mm -hmm. a new place that they haven't been in before. Yeah. It's so important these days that people understand the concept of your restaurant, mm. what to expect before they get there. It's not a spoiler alert, but it's more give me a little taste, a tease as to mm -hmm. what I can expect. So we've had so many amazing new venues open up. Yep. Melbourne and Sydney are equally the food capitals of Australia. Yeah. And we've But so there's other other places that are opening up. I mean, like Canberra's coming yes. up, Adelaide. And I've got to say, because I'm from Sydney, but I moved to Melbourne mm. 12, 13 years ago. I mean, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just want to sort of put this as a as a, as a sort of a disclaimer here. Sydney food scene went down for a while now it's come up now it's really hot again you know but there was a time there where melbourne was just head and shoulders above everybody else mm. so sorry mate continue you know so i think these days no 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 i think you're right mm. and it's swung in roundabouts and yeah. i think it's also been a sign of what consumers want these days restaurants really need to listen to what the consumer's wanting mm -hmm. it's a fine balance between mm -hmm. serving great food having a great experience, providing a great ambience, great atmosphere, bringing to life that concept mm -hmm. instead of just food, yep. which it used to be. Yeah. Now, I've heard you mention the sort of phrase art versus fashion mm. with food and restaurants. What do you mean by that? So these days I think since we're so multicultural with the people that live in Australia, yep. the food that we serve is also quite fashionable too. Fashion is often quite disposable at comes it goes so we've seen burgers go for a craze mm -hmm. we've seen a fried chicken craze yeah you've also seen uh the rise of asian food mm -hmm. and where i guess this is going is if you go to europe you go around the world there's a lot of iconic places they're well known for what they do yeah they don't change the menu the menu's been that way since they started may have evolved a little bit whereas in australia we find that concepts are constantly changing Venues are reinventing themselves. It's always about working with new seasonal product. What's amazing this week or mm -hmm. what's in season, what's not. Mm. So, again, having to be flexible and agile I think is really exciting. Do you get the chance to, um, to travel <coughs> around a lot and eat? So I'll, I'll let you <laughs> have your little – well, I'll ask that question again. You're right there? Yeah, all good. Yeah, cool. So do you get a chance to travel around the world and eat a lot or just – either from your work or just, you know, just because you've done a lot of travelling? Look, loving food as much as I do, yeah. I've always made it a bit of a mission as well yeah. to make the most. So when travelling, it's always good to try new food yeah. in different countries. Work has definitely been a great part in that yeah. because from our point of view, we're curious. Mm -hmm. We're curious to what else is out there. Yeah, It's not just about what's in your backyard. It's about what's going on elsewhere and – looking and seeing competition, cooking competitions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we just recently had Australia represented in the Bacoustior, mm -hmm. which is the World Food yeah. Olympics, yeah, which yeah, yeah. I'm sure you're aware yeah, yeah. of. Yeah, in France. Yes. Was it in Lyon? Where was yeah, it this year? It was in Lyon. Yeah, so I thought so. Yeah. It's every couple of years yeah. and we sent Alexander McIntosh and Tristan Spain up there. From where? And where are they cooking? Where are they? So Alexander's down at South West Brewery in Geelong yep. and Tristan Spain is at... Voudemont in the city. Oh, you're right. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, my wife and I we got we had our wedding reception at Voudemont. So oh, fantastic. So yeah, you know the quality oh, of it's the food. fantastic. Yeah. And just to work with different um, cuisines, different mm -hmm. cultures, we're so lucky, and to be able to travel and eat and try other people's foods, phenomenal. Mm. Yeah, and so where do you think that we sit in Australia? I mean, you know, back in the day, I mean, you always heard the migrants talking about how. You know, they couldn't find an oil. They couldn't find, you know, the kind of ingredients that they were used to cooking with, which obviously spawned all these Greek and Italian delis and 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 all these stores, which are still going strong today. And I think probably in a sense are getting stronger and their shelves are becoming filled with a lot more variety of ingredients. Where does Australia sit in terms of, foodie stuff in the world. I don't, I don't, I don't know how, I don't, I don't really know how, what the proper expression is there. I think from a global level, Australia yep. is very high up there. Yep. Probably being the top five countries in mm -hmm. the world where mm -hmm. despite being as far away as we are, mm -hmm. we've got access to pretty much everything from yep. 
white asparagus that's grown in France mm-hmm. to truffles from Italy yeah. to, you know, Atlantic um, crab mm-hmm. right through. Yeah. We've got Wagyu from Japan that comes in. We're privileged, you know. Mm-hmm. So not only do we have great produce locally, but we've got access to everything from overseas as well. Mm. Probably the other places that have very high quality produce, Japan and Korea. Yep. But again, that's more what they produce locally Mm -hmm. rather than imported products. Yeah, right. Okay. And how has um, the likes of Instagram, you know, really changed? I mean, we know it's changed it, but how has it changed it? I mean, you know, people seeing stuff on Instagram, people seeing food on Instagram, which is attracting them to a restaurant. Uh, You know, it can be a bit of a false economy too, can't it? Because it looks good, but it might not taste good. So... You know, yeah. let's call a spade a spade there. You know, to tell, talk to us about that. These days food is important to showcase and share on social media. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be the end all to every strategy. Mm. The venue also needs to provide an amazing experience and make sure that the expectation lines up with the anticipation that the customer has before they come in. There's no point making beautiful content if you go there and it's, not a good experience and these days venues are learning that because customers are voting with their feet. Mm. Have you eaten a lot in Singapore? I've eaten a little bit in Singapore. Yeah. More of a hawker sort of style right. food rather yeah. than a lot of the fancier restaurants. Yeah. Mm. I, I find it interesting that in Singapore you might go to one of these hawker halls and there will be a, a shop that makes just chicken, you know, chicken breast broiled mm. and it's got a Michelin star. Right. Why don't – why haven't we got a Michelin star restaurant in Australia? I mean, we've got chef's hats mm. and the, the top is, is three. But not even the, the, the Voodamons of Australia, which have got three chef's hat, hats. How come they don't even have one Michelin star? What's going on with that? Well, we don't have a system in Australia for it, so – Well, what, what do you mean by that? What do you mean we don't have the system? What, what system do we need? And part of my ignorance. Sorry. No, no, no. Look, um, I'm not an expert on this, yeah, but right. there's judges and pe- food critics that go mm. around and work for the association yep. to go through grade and score mm-hmm. the venues. Yep. That hasn't come to Australia. We've got our own systems here, which are the hats, as you've just mentioned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just like anything, I guess it's also a very – we don't have the hundreds of years of um, heritage and mm-hmm. culture. Yeah. Um, that a lot of the other places in Europe do. Mm. And to do something consistently, the life cycle of a restaurant in Australia mm. is also a lot shorter. Mm. Mm. Look, I've eaten at um, two Michelin star restaurants in Paris. I've eaten at three, three Michelin star restaurants in Paris. Um, it's a bit of a wank there, wasn't it? Bit of a <laughs> <laughs> Here I think I am. Um, and the reason why I tell you that is because I've eaten at restaurants in Australia that are much better than two chefs. The, like, so then, then two Michelin star restaurants. I mean, one of my favorite restaurants to eat in Australia is Movida. Mm. I mean, I just absolutely love it. I don't think there's anything like it or anything that comes close to it, to be, to be honest, in Australia. Um, Agnes is fantastic as well, but I'd rate these better than some of the two Michelin star restaurants that I've eaten in, in, in Paris. So I, you know, I long to see the day where, you know, we do eventually have it because we've got such a great food culture here. You know what I think Australia does better than anybody else in the world is breakfast. Oh, my God. I mean, yes. seriously. I mean, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time in North America, you know, and I've got a lot of downtime during the week when I'm not doing shows, and I'm out there looking for a great breakfast place. So I go and I, I research this place. I find it's got a great, re- you know, good reviews and so on and so forth. I go there. There's a line of people outside. Not a problem. I'm used to lining up for breakfast, being in Australia. Very average. And people are lining up for a really average. And I thought to myself, you know, if only someone came here and got the top 10 dishes of breakfast, you know, dishes and put them all in one menu in some of the restaurants over there, you you, you would be doing – you'd be making it. A, a mozza for a restaurant tour. Um, I think that we, you know we are probably the world's capital for breakfast. Would you agree? Or I agree. I think Melbourne, yeah. out of Sydney and yeah. Adelaide, mm. Queensland, Melbourne's breakfast scene is phenomenal. Yeah, and it's, it, someplace you got to book. I mean, for people who are watching from overseas, you've got to book some places for breakfast. Mm. 
And that's if they yeah. take bookings. That's if they take bookings. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's that whole, ah, oh, we don't take bookings. You have to rock yeah. up and yeah. hope you're okay. And, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, you find that restaurants here in Australia now are going back to doing what they know best? You know, I, I definitely think restaurants are going back to basics. Right. They're looking and saying what do customers like. Going back to that breakfast, Roasting Warehouse, phenomenal place for breakfast. I don't know if you've been. Where is it? Airport West is where their flagship store is. Right. And they, they actually roast the beans there yeah. as you're having breakfast. Yeah. And that, sorry, that's another thing that we do really well in Australia, which I think we're better than Italy and in France, is the coffee culture. Mm. So, so this what was it called again? It's called Roasting Warehouse. Roasting Warehouse. So obviously they make beans, they roast their beans. But is, is the food there good, as good as well? Is that what you're saying? It's phenomenal. So right. you go there for a nice meal. It's a great place to catch up. It's where I think sometimes food is moving to. It's moving to those more casual scenes at the mm -hmm. moment where it's listening to what people want. People want a nice place they can go to. It's mm -hmm. relaxed. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes not pretentious. It mm -hmm. can just be casual. It's easy. There's something for everyone. But the dishes that they do are all done well. Mm. Yeah, because there is that um, – that there are some really, you know, top-end restaurants, but they really have to – I mean, they have to spend a fortune on fit-out, mm. right, because you because it caters to – the crowd that wants to see and be seen, but they also have to match it with food, right? Where's that going? I think there's definitely the cheap and cheerful, yeah. which has definitely come up as the go-to food for a lot of people these days. Yeah, right. Uh, so, so what define what you mean by cheap and cheerful. So to me, some of my favourite cheap and cheerful places are places like Kamor, which is a beautiful Turkish place. Yep. Um, you've got places like Pacific House mm -hmm. that do great food. Yeah. You've got Luxor King, Soy 38 and those sort of places. Mm -hmm. So it's about 20 to $40 per person. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just something casual. It's mm -hmm. something you can have after work. Yeah. You don't have to think too much yeah. about it. And, and do you think that the, the rise of these kind of restaurants um, is due to a relaxed dining experience or – do you think they're also driven by, I mean, you know, interest rates are going up, you know, um, inflation, you know, cost of living is going up. Which one is affecting it more, do you think? Because, I mean, they've been around for a while. Mm. So it's not like all of a sudden now, you know, they've just popped up everywhere. I think venues that have always tried to do things and feed the masses have always done well. So if you look at Asian food, it's designed to be shared. Mm -hmm. Those venues that have that more mezza style mm -hmm. yep. um, are definitely more approachable these days because mm -hmm. you get a bit more of everything yep. and also you get to share food with people you love, you care about, which mm. I think is really special. Yeah. What sort of trends are we going to be seeing soon? I think a lot of Asian, a lot of sharing. So yep. if you're familiar with Hawker Hall yep. or those sort of venues, yep. You know, we've seen um, White and Wong open up in mm -hmm. Sydney from New Zealand mm -hmm. and now they've just come to Turak Road mm -hmm. in South Yarra. Mm. Um, those are the sorts of places which I think are going to be the future. Yeah. I mean, I can't remember the last time that I went to a restaurant and ordered my m meal and it was just for me. Every time we go out, it's, okay, everyone order something and put it in the middle, mm. you know. And some people don't like to eat like that. Some people, you know, really kind of fussy about that. I, I um, think it depends whether your friends order good food or not yeah, good food. Yeah, well, that's the other thing, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Because I, I, I'm, I, sometimes when, I, when we go to a place and I don't feel like ordering, they're like, Joe, you order because you know what you know to have here. I, I always get stuck with the job of ordering because I'm pretty fussy with, with what I eat, you know. Um, and to the point where sometimes if someone orders something, I go, really? I really, you want to order that? That's going to be your selection? No, I don't, you know, I'd have a debate. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I was just, yeah, interested to know where that was going. What, what, other, what other trends are we going to see, do you think, in moving forward in terms of probably um, not only cuisine, but styles of food or what, what, what sort of, what are restaurants doing that we haven't seen? I guess traditionally, as you said earlier, when you were talking about you hardly ever order a dish just for you. Yeah. We're starting to see a lot more of that through Hot Pot, 
yep. uh, through barbecue as well. So your Korean and your Japanese barbecues. Yep. It's about even cooking for yourself mm-hmm. on the table. Yep. You know, you're going yep. out to this meal, you get to share the atmosphere, order what you want, share, and everyone gets to try. So I think we're moving away from that culture of everyone ordering one dish, one dish, one dish. Mm-hmm. And we're moving away from that to more of a shared concept. So let's go out, let's share some dishes. It may not be Asian. It may definitely be different cuisines. So Spanish is mm-hmm. good. Korean yep. good for sharing. Japanese yep. is good for sharing. Yeah. Um, but where it's going is, you know, good quality products where just good things done right. Yep. And, of course, now we're seeing a lot of um, operators who who have got a flagship of, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, seven, eight restaurants, the Lucas Group, of course, I think probably the kings in Australia in Maryvale, would you yeah. say, in Sydney, who are starting to come here into <laughs> Melbourne. He's just put his toe in the water um, and uh, I think I think they're starting in Lawn. That's correct. The Lawn Pub or something like that, mm. you know. So we're going to start to see the Maryvale Group come here in, in – and that's not a bad thing. I think um, it's exciting. You know, so, so what what are some of your favourite big groups that you work with or that you, who do who you think do a really good job here in Melbourne? Look, I think Lucas Group do a great job of providing an amazing atmosphere and venue. Yeah, so for those people listening, the Lucas Group look after what, Chin Chin? So they've got Chin Chin, they've got Society, Yakamono, yeah. yeah. and probably my favourite of all time, Hawker Hall. Yeah, right. You, know, you like Hawker Hall? I, I do. I, I didn't rate it that much. Well, like, I haven't been for a long time. Is the Hawker Hall the one in um, in Windsor? On, yes, yeah, correct. Right, Chapel so Street, Windsor? I've just had a lot of changes going on right. there recently. So yeah. the last six months, the head chef... Head group chef Johnny Jong, mm-hmm. who's Malaysian, has yep. come in. Right. He's taken it by the reins and really lifted it okay. as well. So yeah, right, yeah. definitely one we should maybe go grab a bite at. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I don't know. I don't really want to talk pl- bad about any places, but I went to that Fonda and I just couldn't understand. I just went there once. I went there twice. I went there three times and I just didn't understand what the vibe I can understand the vibe, good looking crowd or, you know, atmosphere. I just, I kept on seeing it expanding and expanding and I'm going, I don't know, I just don't get it. But, you know, don't want to – look, they're doing well. Good luck to them. You know what I mean? Just the, the question about where it's going as well. Yeah. There are, I believe, two sorts of venues at the moment. Mm-hmm. You've got those venues that focus on the food. Yeah. They want the food to be amazing. Yeah. Everything else just falls into place naturally. Right. Okay. Then you've got other businesses out there which are focusing on the entertainment where yep. – the food is not the important focus, mm-hmm. but providing a good atmosphere is what it's all about. Mm. So you've got some places where food is not the focus, mm-hmm. but it's something that they do, mm-hmm. whereas others, food is the focus. Yeah, and what about, look, you know, for people who don't get a chance, you know, I, I, I tour a lot, you know, I've got a family life now, I don't get a chance to go out as much as I used to. I was out all the time. W- w- what are some of the places in Sydney and Melbourne that are hitting both? Who's doing good atmosphere and good food at the same time? Inchcliffe House in Sydney. Right. Where so are they? So it's just in the main area of Sydney down by Circular Quay there. Yeah, right. So okay. in Hinchcliffe House, which yep. is one of the traditional original sites yep. there. So in there, it's a multi-leveled building. Mm-hmm. It's got four different venues out mm-hmm. of there. They're doing beautiful handmade pastas, good pizzas. It's mm-hmm. just really good food. Yeah. Got little... Area outside as well where yep. they do the sandwiches. Right. So just really good stuff out of there. And in Melbourne? In Melbourne, where's good? Like there's just so many great places. There are so many. But and you know, who if that? I had to pick a couple, look, mm-hmm. for me, I guess uh, good food doesn't have to be expensive. Mm-hmm. I think some of those cheap and cheerful ones do mm-hmm. well. Yeah. You know, places like your Camor. You know, you've definitely got places out there like Philippe, you know, mm-hmm. that do great job. Mm. Uh, Florentinos, you yeah. know, that, that are staples in this industry yeah. that we've learnt to love. Yeah. And I think we eat so differently now. Mm. You've got great bakeries out there, you know. Yes, that, true. You know, now do sandwiches, baguettes. You've got places yeah. like Cavallini yeah. that do beautiful rolls, baguettes, yeah. pastry. Yes. And people often forget about those places. Mm. And it's not just about going out to a fancy place. Yeah. I think it's about good food, it's a good experience and who you're with. Here's a question I've always put to foodies. Why is it that French 
restaurants. Even if French cuisine is supposed to be the haute couture cuisine of the world, you know, the top cuisine of the world, how come we don't see that many French restaurants if it's supposed to be that? Is it, is it do people have a kind of perception that, oh, I'm going to a French restaurant, it's going to be a lot, you know, all I'm going to have is, I don't want a fine dining experience, it's going to be a fine dining experience. Or is it you think it's the cuisine, like it's going to be heavy or there's sauces? What, what do you think that we don't see as many French restaurants as we do Italian restaurants? Okay. French cooking traditionally involves a lot of sauces yep. and a lot of skill to be able to produce those sauces, jus. And it's an art which I think has been lost a bit, which is a bit sad. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at Japanese, for example, let's say Kome Yui, where a lot of things there are done by hand, mm -hmm. it's the processes aren't as complex. Yep. It's a lot simpler. Yep. Whereas with Italian, you've also got a lot more produce here, which mm -hmm. can be pre-bought, you know, to make that process a bit easier. Mm. But with French, it was always about doing everything in-house, making it from scratch, which I think is fantastic. But just with uh, labour costs these days, uh, with the uh, ingredients that we don't have here as well, it is a bit harder to do French food well. Mm. But there are great places that do do it. Yeah. I think the the uh, what I like about eating out in Australia sometimes – when you kind of want to have a bit of a relaxed atmosphere, but you what you want good food is the gastro pub. Mm. You know? uh, and, and it's fun, it's funny when, <laughs> when you say when you say the word gastro pub <laughs> to people from overseas, they're like, what's going on in the pub? What you know, they're thinking gastro is in, you know, you yeah. you're getting gastro. You're getting sick. But obviously it's not. But there's there's a lot. I think there's. Would you say there's more in Melbourne than there is in Sydney gastro pubs? Definitely. Sydney's more full of RSLs and those yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. clubs. Yeah. Whereas Melbourne's got, I think, more of a pub scene. Yeah. You know? And you get some great meals out of pubs now. And yeah. I've always done it well. Yeah. What about some of the independents? You know, the people who are running like Voudemont and all those kind of places. What are, What are some of your favourites there in that in that space? Yeah. Look, Voudemont's always a special place. It's mm -hmm. always beautiful food yeah. um it keeps inventing reinventing itself which i think is really amazing yeah uh that, e that's why i love mavita by the way because yeah. it keeps on reinventing itself sorry come ue is phenomenal i've yep. just opened up in brisbane as well yep. so that's an amazing and, job. and one thing that i loved about Komui is that so i love sushi okay mm. so and my wife knowing that i love sushi for my birthday um not last year the year before she got me a a birthday, a sushi birthday cake. So if you want to get somebody something different, go for the sushi birthday cake. And so it just looks like a cake. Mm. You know what I'm talking about, right? If you actually look on their Instagram, yeah. um, I think actually a couple of days ago, right. there's a video that actually shares a little bit as to what it is. Oh, so right, and how they for those it. out there that want to see it, yeah. have a look at Kome Yui Melbourne yeah. and you'll see a video there. Yeah. What about the country? Because, you know... Um, we're blessed here in Australia that we can get out of the city really quickly and we're finding that there's a lot of regional restaurants which are making it onto the chef's house. I think the Mornington Peninsula area in, in rural Victoria um, has got probably the most number of chefs hatted restaurants per square kilometre. I could be wrong. I know that once upon a time it was. Is it still the same? I think regional is an exciting space to look at if you're yep. looking for something a bit different to mm -hmm. make a road trip out of it. Yep. Get away from the city, get some fresh air. Mm -hmm. Got places like Tedesca, which um, are yep. phenomenal. Right. So again, that's an Italian osteria. Yeah. Yep. Um, beautiful food there with Bridget. She does amazing dishes. Mm -hmm. Everything, as I was saying earlier, is actually cooked in over fire. So. Yeah. I, Again, it's that experience. Mm. Whereas if you go down, I guess, the other side, Gippsland's also got a lot of great venues as yep. well. Places like Hoggart and Lakes Entrance, you've got places like Soda Fish. So there's a lot of really, really good stuff out there. You know, you, 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 you know, like I envy you. So I see sometimes on Instagram what you're doing and I just go, oh, geez. You, I mean, how lucky are you just, you know, going around eating food before everyone else gets to it? You know, it's like... You know, you get to see that. It's, it's, it's fascinating. What You know, this podcast is called, you know, Serious Chat with a Comedian. Tell us something that we don't know. What don't we know about the food industry? Is there some you know, other insights that you can give us that you want to share? 
that you think is exciting happening or in a movement that where we're going? Because it's, it's everyone loves to eat. I don't know anyone who doesn't love to eat. I mean, not everyone is fanatical about eating mm. like some of us are, but I think probably for the, for the foodies out there, what's going on? For the foodies out there, probably what I'd recommend is you may not know this, but at a lot of venues, you go, you look at the menu, you'll always order the same things because mm. you've had it before, you know it's good. Or yeah. some one of the best things which I think you can ever do is actually let the team know, hey, please let the chef decide for me. Right. And they'll put together a menu. They'll ask you allergies or any preferences. Mm -hmm. And instead of having, I guess, a set menu, the chef will create something. The Japanese call it, a, call it an omakase menu mm -hmm. where it just means let the chef feed you. Uh, Italians do a chef's table mm -hmm. where, again, it's what the chef wants to do. Mm -hmm. So you often find that when you do that, you let the chef do what they want to do. Mm. They'll do their magic. They appreciate and want you to try different things. But if you're only going to order the same dishes, mm. you're never going to experience anything new. Mm. Where are some of your favourite eating experiences around the world? For people, I mean, you know, people are starting to travel again now out of COVID. Where, where have you had a great foodie experience? Like for me, San Sebastian. In, in Spain, in the Basque region of Spain is fantastic. I love Spanish food, you know, and, and eating in Barcelona. But, but you know, that I've had a great time there. Peru, I've never eaten in Peru, but I hear Peru is, is really good. Um, I've eaten in Singapore because of the, you know, the reason why I asked you about Singapore earlier was because of the sort of the, the melting pot. Mm. pot. Um, I've eaten at Alina, which is one of the top restaurants in the world in Chicago. That was probably the most d different food experience that I've ever had. Um, and if you if you don't know what it is, have a look it up, Alina, A-L-I-N-A. -A. You'll, um, it's just the molecular food at, at, at such a different level. Um, so along those lines, what, where have you eaten that's sort of blown your mind or, or an experience that, you, mm. that really stayed with you? I think Asia is phenomenal for food. Yeah. I think... A lot of the magic actually comes from local food. It yep. may not necessarily be Michelin star. Mm -hmm. To me, I enjoy street food. Yep. I enjoy trying different things. There are exceptions to that. So yeah. those yeah. listening that know me, <laughs> there are certain things that I won't eat. Yeah. Um, but I think definitely <laughs> yeah. street food is great because you've got a lot of that heritage. It may not be Michelin star, mm -hmm. but again, it's something that's been around. It stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. It's real. I think... Probably some of my favourite memories are definitely in Korea. Mm -hmm. Korea is where I'm from. Yep. Um, going to the beef markets there, mm -hmm. you pick your meat mm -hmm. from beautiful butchers. I've got a different style of beef there. It's called mm -hmm. Hanwoo. So it's like... Hanwoo. Hanwoo. Yep. So it's like the Japanese equivalent of Wagyu. Right. But it's very heavily marbled mm -hmm. but quite balanced. Mm -hmm. So you can actually... Eat a fair bit, which is really bad because yeah, yeah. it's very addictive. Mm. Um, so you go to the butcher, I'll, you'll select your cut, I'll cut it for you, yeah. prepare it for you, almost like the fish markets in Japan. Yeah, right. And then you go upstairs to the restaurants mm -hmm. and they will grill it for you. Yeah, right. So this is just real food. It's just getting great stuff and obviously all the sides and that come out. Yeah. Um, Indonesia, especially through... Bali's mm -hmm. a melting pot at the moment. Mm -hmm. A lot of Australian chefs have opened yeah, up venues yep. over there. So you're starting to see a lot of great food coming out of there mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a few questions before we wrap it up that are kind of mm -hmm. just quick questions that I ask all my foodie friends. Um, apart from a knife, what do you think is um, a very important utensil to have in the kitchen? A fork. you got to eat. <laughs> 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 You could have chopsticks, mate. Yeah, chopstick. <laughs> oh, listen, I'll do the jokes here, Richard. <laughs> um, well, what else do you think? You know, I mean, you are also involved in in you know in that space as well. So, I think look in a kitchen. If you've got the ability to cook outside, a uh, little hibachi mm -hmm. is amazing. Right. Okay. That there is probably one of my favourite toys to play with. Yeah. Because you can't go wrong. Right. What do you think is one of the most underrated ingredients in a kitchen? Salt. Yep. 
Good salt makes a huge difference. Yeah. And now in terms of good salt, you mean cooking? Because um, a lot of people, you know, just think salt, salt, and they'll just use salt, same salt everywhere. When they're salting the pasta in the water, when they're um, salting the salad. Whereas you can have a finishing salt that Correct. you would never put in the water, would you? Correct. But you would, you, you know, yeah. It gives a crunch. I've got mm-hmm. different flavors. Yeah. You've got cold smoked. You've got salt from all around the world. Yeah. So you've got a lot more that you can do with it. Mm-hmm. And I think it really enhances the flavors right. of what you're cooking. If I looked in your pantry today and I opened up, what would be one of the most embarrassing ingredients that you that you have in there? Probably Vegemite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard that they're doing a Vegemite charcoal chicken? Have you heard about that? No, I haven't. Okay. Yeah, all right. All right. Well, we'll we won't go down there. But they, they are. They're doing a Vegemite um, charcoal chicken. Um, what's your favourite, favourite cuisine? Like if I said to you, you can only have, you know, we've got one more day on this earth. What's your, what's your last meal? It's a steak. Really? It, it is okay. a steak, yeah. Yeah. I love my steak and good quality steak. Where do you think we, we've got the best quality steaks in Australia? Where they, where, where do you, who's doing that at the moment? Um, a year station in South Australia, yep. so in the limestone coast area there, just near Mount Gambier. Mm-hmm. They do beautiful, beautiful wagyu. Yeah, cool. Mate, one question, one last question I have. Um, actually, before I do that, is there anything else you wanted to say about food that you wanted to sort of get off your chest that you think that the people should know about food in Australia or anything about food in general? I mean, that's why I got you in here to talk yeah, about look, food. Look, I mate. think these days... I know that a lot of people have allergies, intolerances, but there's also a difference between what we like, what we don't like. Mm -hmm. Sometimes to keep an open mind I think Mm -hmm. is good. If you dictate too much as to what you don't want to eat, Mm -hmm. I don't get why you eat out. Mm. You know, stay at home, make your own food Mm -hmm. if you only want to eat green leaves or something Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, right, okay. Okay, so this is the last question. This is the question that I ask all my guests. What do you do every day to live your best life? You know, what makes Richard get up, motivated, get out of bed and do what you do? Is it, you know, have you got any extracurricular activity? Do you meditate? Do you run? What do you do? I just love what I do. Mm. The people I get to work with, the uh, stories we get to share, it's amazing. And life is beautiful when you do what you love. Now, how can we find you? Like on so you got all your, your, your socials, obviously. What's the best one that people can really see? Is it Instagram? Yeah, so there's Instagram, there's RW Marketing, which is yep. the company that yep. I run, and then there's also my personal one, which is Richard Warnicke. Yeah, W-A-R-N-E-K-E. That's correct. Mate, it's been lovely chatting. I know we've been talking about it for a long time. You know, and sometimes, you know, my podcast is sometimes the only way that I can catch up with my mates. I know. know. We get a chance and to, I'm so glad we're here. So. Yeah. Thanks Thank you for much. having me. No worries. Thank you very much.